In the world of model railroading, there's always the strive to model the unusual or interesting aspects found in the real world. One of the most unusual freight car loads I've come across is the transportation of glass cullet or crushed glass. While it's not a very common load, it definitely falls into the category of eye-catching and may be one of the most interesting pieces on your layout. In this video, we'll go over some of the background of glass cullet production, prototype information for the layout, materials to build the load, and finally, we'll build one together. Glass cullet is generally formed as a byproduct from glass manufacturing and is the waste glass that cannot be used for its intended final product. Cullet can also be formed from recycling commercial glass product, crushing the glass almost to a powder-like consistency. Once the cullet is formed, the glass can be used in a variety of ways. The most obvious answer is recycling the glass into more commercial glass products, but other more obscure applications include construction for new roads, buildings, cars, or smaller applications like fiberglass or insulation materials. While glass recycling is much more prominent in European countries, there still is glass recycling facilities in every major metropolitan area across the United States. The glass recycling facilities are generally on the smaller side and typically owned by one of two companies in the United States. Strategic Materials and Potter Industries are two of the larger national companies that provide large-scale glass recycling in several states. For demonstration purposes of this video, a strategic materials site in St. Louis, Missouri will be the example industry. The actual glass facilities generally receive their glass product from a variety of sources such as breweries, garbage recyclers, or really anyone just wanting to recycle their glass products. These shipments are normally received by truck but may receive larger shipments via rail as well. Glass cullet is a powdery substance and is transported on rail by covered hopper or open top hopper cars as well. Once at the facility, the rail car is positioned over a trough, dumped the cullet, and then can be collected by front loaders. The glass is then processed through a series of filtering techniques, metals and other debris are removed, and finally is sorted by color. Most facilities seem to sort their glass into several grades of sizes as well as color. Amber colored, blues and greens, and finally clear glass are generally the three main types but may differ to fit the individual customer's needs. The final product is then loaded via an auger or a front loader for final delivery. As mentioned, the glass cullet is a powdery substance and is made from silica or sand. Thus, when modeling the loads, the glass cullet properties should resemble sand. The glass cullet can be transported by a covered hopper, and judging from Google Map photos, this is the preferred use of transportation. Another option is the standard open top hopper, which offers the benefit of easier loading by a front loader or an auger on site. Since sand or silica is on the more dense side, most facilities will opt to load the rail cars to approximately 75-80% to 80 full to stay under the 100 ton limit. While covered hoppers may be the preferred choice to best show off this load, our example will utilize the open top hopper. The materials needed to complete this load are relatively straightforward. The first item is the example car that you're going to be building the load for. Looking at several prototype photos, one of the best examples is the 14 rib 100 ton open top hopper, with a good example being the Bowser 100 ton hoppers. There's not a large supply of prototype photos online, and one of the most prominent road names was a private rail car leasing company, Everest Rail Car Services, or EAMX. While the example car is not set in stone, the load will look better if built for a specific manufacturer and model. The next required material is sculpt mold. This will be used to create the profile of the glass load. I found most of the pre-made ballast loads were not shaped how I saw the prototype photos, so I elected to build my own. If you plan on building your own load, you will need a few additional materials like styrene, sculpt mold, and a steel weight will be helpful. Additionally, you'll need white paint, a flat clear coat, glue water mixture, glitter, and general modeling tools. For this example, I chose to model the prototype photo of EAMX 328, which appears to be transporting bulk waste glass due to the different colors of blues, greens, and whites. Building the actual glass cullet load is pretty straightforward. In this first section, the base of the load will be built for the hopper, so if you're using a pre-made ballast or stone load, then you can skip ahead. For the Bowser car body, the styrene was cut to 5 and 3 8 inches long and 1 and a quarter inches wide. The styrene I chose to use was 60 thousandths, which provides some good rigidity while also being relatively inexpensive and thin. When the glass load is added to the styrene base, some material generally gets attached to the side so the base should be cut to leave some clearance on the sides and to not have a press fit that may bow out the car body sides. For the bases, the styrene is cut slightly shorter than the top of the open top hopper such that the base sits a little bit lower in the car body for a more prototypical load height. Any raised edges or burrs are sanded away and the ends of the styrene base 
or sand it down to form a beveled edge to allow the styrene base to lay flat against the hopper ends. At this point, builders can opt to glue a piece of bar steel weight to the underside of the styrene sheet. The steel weight can serve many purposes. The weight can help keep the styrene sheet straight and flat as the materials tend to shrink a little bit when the glue is applied to the load profile. The reasons I added the steel weight was the added heft to the open top hopper as well as the steel provides an easy way to remove or install the loads with the help of a magnet. One of the main reasons the pre-made ballast loads are not ideal for this application is the profile of the ballast loads and the steepness do not match the prototype photos of the load. The shape that we will try to replicate is a relatively shallow, uneven load similar to sand loads. Building up the profile can be achieved by several materials, but I found through trial and error that sculpt mold was the easiest to work with and being relatively inexpensive. The other main option was the use of ballast from companies like Woodland Scenics, but was subject to a lot of shrinkage and could not get a smooth finish. A small batch of sculpt mold was made, mixed to the consistency of cottage cheese, and then scooped on to the styrene base. The idea when profiling the mound is to keep the height on the lower side while keeping the overall mound somewhat flat. On the edges, the sculpt mold is smoothed away to meet flushly up with the edges. The working time of sculpt mold is pretty generous and gives the builder about 15 minutes until the sculpt mold is dry. After about 10 minutes of drying, I go back to the sculpt mold and using water, the profile can be worked with my fingers until the surface is smooth. I usually give the sculpt mold about a day to fully dry out and become rock solid. At this point, if there's any imperfections or holes in the profile, it can be sanded away or filled with modeling putty. Once you're happy with the shape of the load and the load is fully cured, then it's time to paint. If you use sculpt mold to build the base, then the base should be relatively white and you can skip this step, but if you used a different material, then it will require a white finish. The white does a good job of hiding any imperfections in the glass load as well as brightening up and bringing out the color. Blending the glitter mixture is one of the most important parts of this process as it dictates the final color of the product. I ended up only using two of the glitter mixtures, the aqua silver and the white. I did several test examples with gluing and final clear coat to see the best color I wanted to achieve. The first glass load is solely the aqua mixture and while I think it does represent a good color, it's definitely too bright and almost like the contrast is turned up to 100. The middle load is approximately 5 parts white glitter and 1 part aqua. To me this seems the best one, a nice color but not too intense. The last one is 10 parts white, 1 part aqua. In some prototype photos, I think this is the most correct looking load, but honestly on the layout and under layout lighting, it's just a little too bland and we're going for an interesting load. I ended up choosing the middle mixture and as mentioned, the middle load was created with five parts white and one part aqua. I had done this test several times and knew the ratios I had wanted to achieve, so I just dumped the correct measurements of both colors into the mixing cup, but viewers should add the white first and then slowly blend in the aqua. It's very easy to darken the glitter mixture to the aqua color, but it takes a lot of white to actually dilute it back. You can see here where I'm comparing the glitter mixture to the final glass load, and while they don't exactly match right now, you can expect the final clear coat to brighten up and bring out the little bit of the color when sealing the load, so to be sure to account for that. Preparing the glass load for glitter is pretty simple. A 50-50 Mod Podge water mixture is slowly painted onto the glass load, making sure to completely coat the top and getting all the nooks and crannies as well. Try to avoid the sides and the edges, but this can be sanded off when dry. Any pools of glue should be blotted off with a paper towel. The pools can cause the glitter to kind of bubble up and will make uneven lumps. On to the fun part, the load is placed into a larger container to catch any overflow of glitter, and the glitter mixture is slowly spooned on. There's no real technique to this except trying to keep the glitter layer relatively thin Clumping is going to be the real enemy here. Also, when the glitter is on the load, any attempt to move the glitter will ruin the underlayer and it will have to be reapplied. After the glitter is evenly applied to the load, the load is then removed and shaken off to remove any glitter that did not adhere to the glue. You're going to lose a lot of the glitter here, but it's all right. The load usually takes two to three layers of glitter to get a full application. However, if you're happy with this color, you can just go ahead and skip right to the final sealment. After the glue has dried, the glitter load is pretty bare and requires another few layers. Any additional layers can follow the same process as well. The glass load is then coated with another layer of clear coat to help seal in the initial layer. Once the clear coat is dry, it's time to apply another layer of glitter and for additional layers, the glue is not applied before the glitter. 
The second layer of glitter is slowly sprinkled over the load, similar to the first time, trying to fill all the bare base underneath. Extra care is added to try to avoid thick layers of the glitter. When you're happy with the glitter coverage, the glass load is taken to the spray booth where another layer of clear coat is applied to seal in the glitter. Because the second layer of glitter is not attached to anything, builders should spray the clear coat directly down from the base from a relatively far distance, approximately two feet, so that the clear coat falls directly onto the glitter, more like a rainfall, and doesn't directly spray away any of the loose glitter. This layer of clear coat is just meant to hold the glitter in place so that we can properly glue the glitter permanently. You can repeat adding layers of glitter and spraying the clear coat until you're happy with the final coverage of the glass load. The glass load is then sprayed with a wet water solution, approximately 100 parts of water to 1 to 2 parts of dish soap. I used a fine spray mist bottle for this, but also an eyedropper can be used if your spray mist isn't very fine. While the glitter is slightly being held down, glitter may still bubble up and clump up if you're not using a fine mist application. When the glue load is saturated with the water, then the Mod Podge glue mixture is applied to the top of the load, completely soaking it to ensure proper glue application. The glass load is then left to dry for 24 hours. After drying, I like to apply several light coats of clear coat to add a second layer of protection to the glass load. If any material has built up on the sides, which happens every single time, the sides of the glass load are sanded down to the correct proportions. The beveled edges on the ends may also need to be cleaned up and reprofiled. The glass load is then final test fitted into the hopper and ready for revenue service. Overall, I really liked making this product because it's a very interesting eye-catching piece. It's very cheap to make and overall it's just fun. I believe adding up all the costs it came out to like $2 per load and it only takes a few hours to make. I ended up making seven to eight variants of this with different color profiles and sizes to fit other open top hoppers. This is also a great piece to set up an in industry because it's a small scale operation only requiring one track, one or two car slots, and it doesn't require any large or complex buildings. You can very easily recreate this industry with just a pike stuff building, an auger, and some concrete blocks. I really haven't seen any prototype photos, but I'm currently working on an amber colored glass load, but I'm still working on getting the color profile correct. But let me know what you guys think about this piece. If you guys are going to be working or adding something similar to your guys' layouts. Comment, rate, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.